Universities History Department. Thank you for the recording. Uh, Thursday seminar. Uh, we are here to welcome Andy Manson, who is launching his book. Um, I am not going to take any much, uh, more of your time. Uh, let's say that, Andy, we're going to give you about 20 to 25 minutes. And then uh, James Drummond from Geography will be the discussant. And then I will just uh, mediate the questions. So thank you. Uh, Andy, you can start. Swallow, Chris. Yeah. Is this on? Yes. Uh, good afternoon and welcome all of those near and far. Um, this is quite a special opportunity and occasion for me. This is the university where I taught at for many years. Specifically, I was began here in 1984 um, and I took early retirement in 2005. And then in 2012, came back again with my tail between my leg legs to take up a, a research post here and I spent another four or five years here. So all in all, it's been it's been a long time. And um, this book uh, of, on Christopher Bethel, in fact, began um, almost the very year that I set foot on this campus. Um, but I will kind of come come to that story as we as we proceed along. Um, this book was published in 2021 by UNISA Press. <clears throat> um, um, I'm sure all of you will then immediately be able to recognize that it was the, the COVID epidemic um, that we were plunged into after that um, meant that I was not able, in a sense, to launch the book formally in any kind of sense. So we've had this idea, uh, Laura and I, um, of being able to kind of combine a book launch together with a, a discussion of the book. So um, it's a part part kind of seminar, part book launch. Um, and I do have some copies of the book here, if anyone would like to purchase them from me. Uh, they're very modest price, only 140 Rand per copy. So what I want to do is, um, yeah, to, to welcome you all, um, and particularly to... Uh, to Neil Parsons, who um, was very important in the sense that Neil gave me a lot of feedback on the manuscript of this book and many ideas um, for how it could be improved. Um, and I hope I've, in the end, done justice to the the kind of contributions that he wished be wanted me to to follow up uh, in in the final uh, analysis. Um, what I want to do is to try and because I imagine a lot of people really don't know who Christopher Bethel was, um, to give a brief summary of the book, which is I always find exceptionally difficult because I tend to kind of either compress or elongate sections and then find myself running out of time towards the end. But I'll do my best. When we miss things, we can always pick them up in question time or through the discussants. The book is entitled The Valiant Englishman, um, which is a quotation which comes uh, from the, the Reverend Mackenzie, John Mackenzie, who was an LMS missionary uh, in Bechuan land. Um, and he was one of the, I say, one of the few people to, to recognize the, the importance of a figure like Bethel um, when he, at the same time, a, 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 quite a number of official colonial officials um, certainly thought a lot less of him than that. Um, so it's entitled Christopher Bethel Monsiwa's Barrelong and the Betcher Land Wars of 1878 to 1886. So who was Christopher Bethel? Well, he was an English aristocrat. Uh, he came from the country, the county of, uh, of Yorkshire in England. Um, his family uh, were landed gentry, I suppose you could say. And when Christopher was brought up, clearly he was he was destined for life, either following the same kind of line as his father, or in as a in public service of some kind. Um, I never was able to find out where he went to school, but he went to university at Cambridge and very quickly disgraced himself. He got into gambling debts. 
um, and he was sent out to South Africa as the kind of classic remittance man, send him to the colonies, get him out the way, see whether he can improve his character. So he arrives in South Africa in 1878, um, and he's introduced, he has a through his family an introduction to Charles to Charles Warren, um, about whom a very excellent biography has recently been written by Kevin Shillington. And Warren arranges for him to take up a position in the in the military in the Bechua, in Bechuanaland. It's the tail end of the so-called Griqua revolt. Um, and he finds himself um, in Kimberley. There's no real record, not much in the record, about what um, he achieved during that time. But we do know that after that, Warren sent, sent him, post, uh, appointed him as an intelligent officer and posted him along with three other uh, men uh, to act as a kind of eyes and ears of the colonial order in the territory beyond the newly formed crown colony of Griqualand West. And while he was here, uh, it was while he was here that um, he befriended the Rachidi Barolong. Um, and in particular, um, he became friends with the, the Hossi uh, Monsiwa. Um, and subsequently, he met a Moralong woman, a Tepo Boapile, um, and they fell in love, and he married her. Um, but the whole story is, a sense, set against uh, a number of, of, of determining kind of historical features and aspects. So the one is which, of course, that this territory was part of a struggle between, between different uh, forces. I mean, the British obviously wanted to control this area as a the so-called road, road to the north, the road to the interior. There were pressures coming from German East Africa, which had a, a, a possible ambitions of linking up with the Transvaal colony and in that way kind of blocking uh, imperial expansion. Um, British, certainly British control of the region. So it's, it's, it's a long and quite complex story um, and context in which Bethel found himself interacting. Specifically, though, um, he was posted initially to Sahuba, which, as you know, is about 15 kilometers outside Mafeking. Um, and there he was, as I say, to act as the kind of eyes and ears, to give any kind of forewarning as an intelligent officer. It was never a kind of formal position, but Beth Bethel always regarded himself um, as, an, as a, a fully constituted official and would sign himself in 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 those terms whenever he wrote to 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 people of importance. Um, he then found himself caught up in the Bechuan land wars, um, which were, I suppose you could say, were instigated by the ambitions of the Transvaal Republic to extend its control westward over the very fertile and certainly from the point of view of irrigable lands uh, on, in which the Baralong, Sidi Baralong and the other Baralong factions found themselves. So um, those, as these, uh, as the crisis kind of crisis unfolded, um, Matha King itself uh, was subjected to what, what I refer to as the first siege of Mafeking. Um, and the it was a time really when, much like the, the more famous siege of Mafeking later on, uh, where kind of starvation, um, and the, the, the town was surrounded. It was, it was on a kind of nightly basis. Um, it was bombed and bo cannon fire. And there are many similarities between the between the two incidents, the first siege of Mafeking in 1884-85 um, and the later one in 1899-1902. And that those events, I think, are not very well known by 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 people who live in Mafeking uh, and by 
those who have an interest even in Babylon history. I want to say also that, okay, as, as the story kind of works itself out, um, Bethel was in the end uh, killed very shortly after he got married. Uh, Tepor was in fact at the time pregnant. Um, and his death sparked a uh, quite intense um, discussion and observation and criticism uh, back home in England, largely led by his family <clears throat> and also by colonial officials on the spot and certainly people like Reverend John Mackenzie. Um, and it led eventually, of, of course, to, to the to Britain taking much firmer steps uh, to extend colonial control to this part of the country, to what became British Bechuan land. So in a sense, you know, Bethel, Bethel did not die in vain. Uh, one could say that in some senses he, he was a, his, his death was a kind of trigger for imperial intervention. Um, and in the long run, that was a form he was able, in a sense, to help in the in casting a kind of mantle of, of protection over the Baralong people. The story of Bethel's life is very complicated because there are different Baralong factions, you know, the and not all of those factions were acting together. Um, in many senses, some of the other Baralong factions were fighting for the freebooters or the mercenaries. That whole kind of concept of freebooters and mercenaries is, is an interesting one and needs perhaps to be investigated more in the, in the South African context, who the, were these people. But essentially, they were people, you know, who were looking for quick returns in land, m money, or, or cattle in particular. Um, the sad part about it is that Grace, who was... Bethel's daughter, Grace Bethel, who was born, of course, after he died, was subsequently disinherited. Um, there was quite a well-known court case uh, which was was held in Britain, uh, which held that uh, Bethel had not been married according to Christian rites, but had been married according to kind of polygamous, foreign, African forms of marriage and attachment, um, and she was disinherited. I was not able to 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 trace very far, unfortunately, what happened to Tepo uh, after Bethel himself was was very brutally murdered, um, not far from here. In fact, when I first came to these parts, there was a road which goes out past the Bopalong Hospital to the Ditsabotla, um, and there was a sign up there just saying Bethel a rusty sign half fallen down. Um, and that presumably marks the scene where, where he actually lost his life. And I mean, he, the way he lost his life is also quite interesting. You know, it was, he was just ridiculously kind of brave and foolhardy in many ways. The book also deals with, you know, ways in which we can interpret Bethel, what type of a person he was, which I won't go kind of go into here. Clearly, you know, he doesn't kind of fit the the, the conception we have uh, of a British aristocrat at the height of imperial powers. Um, and those kind of discussions about where he fits in and what he represents, I think, are something that people can think about or discuss or when they read the book, think about. Um, and it, particularly in the context of kind of recent uh, histories which, um, you know, have have kind of, how can I say, they've, they've kind of played down, uh, the, or they've played up the extent of, of colonial kind of, you know, what, what, how much do we owe to, to kind of colonial, must we blame kind of colonial, efforts in this in this part of the world the whole kind of rose must fall debate um and it, it's the story is quite interesting i think in that context 
I just wanted to say a few things also about um, a lot of the material I got from this book uh, was from the work of uh, Sitsele Murdire Mumilema, um, who um, wrote a book on Monsiwa entitled uh, Monsiwa Baralong Chief and Patriot. And he, I think, is a figure which, uh, who, because he came from Mafeking, is somebody that, uh, you know, I would like, in a sense, to to show how much I owe to this to this book. Um, he was a, as you know, a medical doctor. He studied at the University of Glasgow, studied medicine, um, and he wrote his three most well-known books, Monsiwa Baralong, Chief and Patriot, uh, and a, a biography of Chief Morocco. Um, and he also wrote uh, a third a third book um, entitled The Bantu Past and Present, an ethnological and historical study of the native races in South Africa. Um, um, and I think he's, he's a very interesting figure. Um, you know, just to be able to have written um, three books of this nature to have played a major role uh, as the treasurer of the African National Congress from 1949 to 53, um, and to combine that with being a medical doctor, I think uh, is a marvelous achievement. Um, and uh, there has been, I think, growing attention in recent years to his writing. Um, and to the way in which he attempted, in a sense, to explain to Europeans um, and to white people living in South Africa, you know, the, the qualities and the nature of African life. So um, I just wanted to, you know, point out the importance of the, of the book for me personally in the writing of this, of, uh, of this book, of his, of his book. Um, I also would just like to say a, a word or two about how this book came about. Uh, when I first arrived here, um, I met somebody called Connie Minchin. For those of you who live in Mafeking will know that there is a Connie Minchin Primary School, which is named after her. And Connie was a kind of, I suppose you could say, an amateur type historian. Um, and she always used to go on about to me about you know Christopher Bethel, and she was intending to at one point to write the story of Christopher Bethel. At that stage, like most of us, I had very little idea of who he was. Um, um, and then, as the years passed, she she bequeathed to me and gave me all her papers, all her photographic material, um, and it was something which I. I wanted almost to fulfill um, because of the kind of enthusiastic person she was and her desire to promote local history. So um, I would like to acknowledge the role that Connie played um, in, 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 in motivating me to write this book. Um, and yeah, I think I'll uh, I kind of leave it at that. I I know I've I've tried to compress quite a lot. I've probably missed out several important aspects um, of the book, but perhaps it can be they can be raised in any kind of discussion form as we go along. Thanks. Thank you, Andy. Uh, I now give over to James Drummond. Can you hear me? Okay. First of all, let me say um, what a very great pleasure this is to be asked to comment on Andy's book. I arrived here in 1984, fresh from Glasgow University, and Andy, together with Leslie Witts and later Paul Lahos dumped a pile of South African history books on my desk and said, here, read these. 
And as a geographer with no formal training in history, I was quite taken aback. But I did read them and fell under their influence. And I've incorporated historical perspectives in a lot of my own research on this area. Now, since Andy mentioned Molema, I must tell you something that's probably not widely known here. Glasgow University um, undertook a renaming exercise, also influenced by the whole culture wars debate. And they found that the geology department, uh, which fell under the School of Geographical Sciences, had been named after a man called Gregory. And when they looked at his writings, they actually thought they were racist. So they decided to rename the building. And it's renamed after Malema. It's the Malema building. And it's quite an important building at Glasgow University. So I just thought I would flag that since Andy mentioned it. Andy stimulated my interest in history, and I published with him. Um, we wrote a chapter together on the border landscape and the relations across that border landscape, um, really from the 1870s to the present day, and the way in which they were influenced by Botswana's independence. Um, Andy wrote his PhD on the Hrutsi, and... I did my master's degree at VETS on uh, Dinokana in Moyowa's Reserve. And we wrote a paper together on betterment and agricultural change in Moyowa's Reserve. So he's been responsible for awakening my interest in history. I've been waiting for the book for a long time. I also knew Connie mentioned well, and I knew about this pr project. It's a really interesting read. If any of you know anyone with contacts in the film industry, please pass it on and tell them to read it because it would make the most stunning movie. I mean, of this young English aristocrat who comes out here from Cambridge in shame, and then he marries a Baralong, a Mar 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 woman, and then has this amazing political alliance with Monshiwa. And then he gives up his life for the Baralong. It's an astonishing story. And one which I think needs to be read by many more people. I teach the scramble for Africa and the way in which the colonial borders were laid out. I'm teaching it right now. And I couldn't help but think when I read this book that this period of the 1870s and 1880s, when there was this conflict, contest for land and water um, and the resources that flow from that, between the Botswana, the Boers, and the British, really encapsulates what the scramble for Africa was about. Because you've, I mean, war and Bethel's death really opens the road for deeper British involvement um, going north and securing Bechuanaland and Rhodesia. Um, and I think it's a, it's a very significant part of, of that story. The other thing that strikes me is in terms of debates on Mahi Keng's latent heritage, I hadn't heard of the first siege of Mafeking. That was news to me. And I thought I had reasonable knowledge of this area's history. Didn't know about the first siege. And I didn't know about the Battle of Tigele. And I didn't really know about the Battle of Dimawe either until it was raised in earlier seminars in this series this year. But these events, I think, were very important um, in the history of Mahi Keng and its surrounding areas. And I think they should be commemorated in the museum. There has to be a place for this story in terms of the heritage of Mahi Keng, because I think it's one that can 
possibly help um, break down some preconceived racial opinions of what life was like in the late 19th century. I've read Alan Lester's um, review of uh, this book and of Warren's book in the South, South African Historical Journal. Um, and I think it deserves a wider readership. Um, I think, Robert, I'll finish there. Otherwise, I'll just put my own geographical slant on things even further and open things up for interpretation. Yeah, I think uh, in just to respond to some of the th issues which James raised, um, Sol Pleike, I think, uh, refers to the fact that there were something like four or five previous sieges of Mafeking. Um, he kind of disaggregates, you know, the, the sieges, the, the, the first siege and breaks it up into various components and parts. And he uh, identifies, I think, four or five. I can't quite remember. Um, but yes, you know, I mean, this is a siege town. This is a frontier town. Um, um, and it was a, con a contested, a, a hotly contested area. And it has that kind of heritage and background. Um it's disappointing, you know, if one goes, for example, down to the, the museum here, um, that one sees, I haven't been for a long time, um, but that one sees so little of this kind of local history um, being incorporated into a venue where people can go perhaps and absorb it uh, in, in, in an easier form than having to, to read and, you know, uh, to read it. Um, and indeed, I don't know at, at this point in time, because I haven't been there for a long time, you know, how much the, the museum reflects um, the history of that period of uh, Monsiwa's uh, period of uh, control over the over the Baralong here. Um, but my sense is that it's not, you know, it's not kind of represented in any kind of serious form. So those, I would imagine, will be the kinds of places where, um, where this, you know, it, it could be kind of uh, located as a as a, as a, as a heritage for 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 this area and for the people of South Africa generally. Uh, um, what was the other issue, James, who raised about the, the scramble for us? Yeah. Um. Yeah, I think, you know, and I didn't deal with it very well, but I mean, uh, clearly um, there are sections in the book uh, which detail in, which give in far more detail the process by which um, this this area was taken under kind of co under colonial control and the division of British Bechuan land and the Bechuan land protectorate. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that, although I may come back to the point you made about the review of the book. Um, thanks. Um, I'm going to uh, ask the Mafeking audience if there's anybody, uh, before before we, we, we uh, give attention to the people joining us online, uh, I wanted to know if there's anybody from the the, the live audience um, that wants to respond, that has a question, a comment, anything like that, that you want to specifically contribute before we go online. Mr. Mafora, can you just switch on your... So we really appreciate the views and what um most my what I mostly appreciate about the views that come from the books is how it extends the view of native of other nostalgia nostalgia is seen by Jacob Lamin. so I would like to know that okay since the British in the views of Afri South African historiography, the British 
contrary to the African nationalists, they are said to have mothered the black nation in a way. So was Mr. Andrew able to obtain any part of the historical events whereby Christopher played part in perhaps maybe if we can look back to these events, we can say, okay, we can add on to the history of nostalgia and say, rather than speaking of um, the black man was being oppressed, but then we'd actually have exemplary events whereby we say, okay, here's how Christopher was adding actually to the Botswana people, to the people of Botswana land. Because we, yeah, like I mentioned, we are looking for, to extend the history of nostalgia as had been seen also by the likes of Jacob Lamini. I, I can't say I heard the entire question either, but you were speaking of nostalgia and, and how this links to nostalgia. Uh, can you just can you just repeat that, but can you speak into the mic? Just the nostalgia part. Sorry. The nostalgia part. We I was asking if Mr. Andrew was able to get events whereby Christopher contributed to the narrative of nostalgia that we could actually the events that actually we that we could actually add onto it, onto the that's a little of nostalgia. Yeah. Uh, do you mean in, in in what ways perhaps does the Bethel story feed into a narrative of of nostalgia of a humanitarian ways, past? especially? Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I I, just, I mean, it it's something which may come uh, in time, um, and if the, you know, if the Bethel story were more kind of widely understood and talked about and discussed. Um, if it can kind of comparisons can be made in in other kind of colonial contexts, um, then then we may be able to talk about the way in which we look at this period of history, um, and how it perhaps uh, didn't conform to some of the typical kind of conceptions of what characterized a colonial past, um. But I think the, the purpose of, part of the purpose anyway of writing the book was just to try and get the story out there. And then people from then on uh, can can run with it and, and in different directions and different kinds of ways. Um, and then it might kind of feed into the way, you know, of nostalgia and issues of ways in which the past is, can be represented. There's actually a very strong literature on um, colonial nostalgia deals with India um, and countries like Malaysia, but India in particular. But the amazing thing about Mahi Kang is that when you tell these stories, um, you've got African authors, you've got Malema writing the story of Monshiwa, you've got Saul Plaki writing about the siege in his diary, um, giving you an account of what happened from a black man's perspective. So there doesn't need to be a nostalgic celebration of British colonialism, but you can look at what happened with British colonialism and bring it back into the museum, but portray it through the lens of African writers. And I think that's an amazing opportunity that we have here. Yes, and of course, Malema was not the only kind of black intellectual um, to to present to us a, a picture of African life and customs and histories. Um, there were there's many others, so but he forms part. Or he's certainly one of those very kind of important writers uh, who historians, kind of more recently, I think, have been trying to expose uh, and write about more much more fully. Anybody else from the audience? 
thank you, Prof. Manson. Uh, yeah, um, first, I'd like to say there's a Bethel, there was a Bethel College. I'm not sure if it's in Lichtenberg or some way, but I think there was a Bethel College and there was a fire and there was like, I think it was, it fell into ruin. So that Bethel that you're speaking about might have to do with Bethel College. There is a, there was a Bethel College. I'm not sure if it's still in existence or not. Yes, I think that Bethel College is in Lichtenberg, um, but it's spelt with an L and not, not a double L. So it's not actually um, after after Bethel. Um, Tepo, uh, Bethel, um, who earned the name of Matebele among the, the, the local people here, Ma, after named of the Bethel, Matebele. Um, she remarried a an Englishman by the name of Jones, and she moved up to Bulawayo. But subsequently, uh, she moved back into into South Africa, and she actually ended up teaching at a at a high school in Luxembourg. And there's a photograph of her in the book um, at a, a gathering or convention of of teachers, um, and that I think is the last. Um, or last, the only um, evidence I have of what you know of what she did do during her life. But I, I missed the boat really because when I got here to Mafeking, there were people in Mafeking who knew the family um, and would have been able to to give me more information about them. Um, but I was slow off the mark. It took me many many years to write the book, and I should have. If I'd followed up then, I think we would have been able to trace trace much more accurately what happened to to Grace. Both both Grace and Teppel uh, were were teachers. Um, but but that but for, I know that college. So it was there was a lot of student protests there, and there was a fire there, as you mentioned. I think at one stage, which almost burnt the. Okay, anybody else from the Mafeking audience, from the live audience, want to ask a question? Nobody. All right, um, shall we then move to our online audience? Um, if anybody has a particular question, can you just put up your hand? Um, I, I am, yeah, if, if, I just wanna, I can't see anything popping up. Laura, I see you opened your mic. Do you have a question? Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Oh, yes, great. we can Hi. hear you. Um, thanks very much, Andy, um, for the presentation. Um, and in fact, I'm really looking forward to reading the book. Um, I have uh, two kinds of questions. The first relates to the context, to, to Christianity. You made a comment right at the beginning about uh, tensions between Bethel and, and various missionaries. And I'm wondering to what degree um, missionary activities and Christianity more generally is shaping the context in which these alliances are being made or tensions are developing. That's my first question. And then the second question relates to um, Alan Lester's review of the book, um, and I, I'm, I'm sure many or uh, perhaps only some of the people in the audience have uh, looked at the review of the book, um, and he uh, asks kind of or he kind of probes the question about Bethel's view on race um, and on what Bethel might have called civilization and kind of hier hierarchies and civilization. Could you comment a little bit more um, on that? What was how, how did Bethel position himself within this kind of um, racially um, ordered world. Yes, uh, I I didn't quite get the first question, Laura. It was it was a t Bethel at Bethel and the missionaries, Bethel and yeah, how, how Christianity was shaping the context in which uh, people were making alliances. Um, you said I think if I caught at the beginning that Bethel had quite a tense relationship with some of the missionaries. Um, how did uh, how did did that mean that uh, there was uh, very little Christian influence in what that was shaping the relationship between Bethel and the Baralong? Um, how were they positioned in relation to the missionaries? 
Um, yeah, look, I, the, 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 the missionary that, uh, uh, who ap appeared to find, you know, who, the, the missionary about uh, who, who attracted attention or wrote particularly about Bethel was in fact Mackenzie. Um, and he encounters him at various points during his travels in 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 this in this vicinity. Um, and the you know the 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 way the kind of colonial officials regarded Bethel, uh, they saw him as a kind of you know a, a man who interfered where he wasn't needed, um, as someone who was. Um, endangered the kind of uh security of 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 the area by his you know by his rash by his kind of rash uh, actions um but mackenzie in a way um sees him in a in a much more positive light um as a man who embodied the kind of virtues of of english valor of english fair play um, and he kind of holds that up in contrast uh, to the way in which these colonial officials kind of put Bethel into some kind of particular box as a, as a kind of troublemaker. Um, and so, the, you know, he saw as, as embodying much more positive um, kind of virtues which should be followed in, 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 in kind of colonial policy. Um, than than was the situation. So I mean, he he really does cast him in a in a different light to the way in which he was seen by uh, the average colonial official. Um, the review by um, by Lester, yeah, I I think that probably that the problem with the review, first of all, is that um, I don't think he only very narrowly kind of looks at the the way in which the two books overlap, uh, which is that of the period in which both personalities were involved in Bechon land. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a vast section of, of Kevin Shillington's book, which is simply not looked at. Um, and the second thing I think is that he also reviews my book and probably Kevin's to a certain extent from, you know, as James was saying, from a, quite a, a specific a viewpoint which he himself is interested in, which is to do with the, I think, the clash of cultural, you know, cultural values, et cetera. Um, and I mean, I, it, it wasn't something which I was primarily interested in, in, in kind of talking about. It was just something I put in at the end because of the roads must fall controversy at the time. And simply wanted to point out, you know, that we shouldn't stereotype uh, all colonial figures in the way perhaps Rose has been seen. And um, that there is another story. Uh, there is a is, there is a greater complexity perhaps to the picture. Um, and it was just for something to think about. Um, but I think he picked up on that uh, and rather made too much of it in my mind. I, I don't know whether that answers your questions, Laura, but... Yeah, thank you. And I, I must say, I agree with you, particularly on the second, <laughs> on the latter. We're having a bit of a mouse problem. So um, <laughs> so if anybody uh, also wants to answer a question, sorry, I can't see the screen at the moment, but uh, will you just unmute yourself and ask the question? Somebody online? I can see that there are two hands up online. Um, so I think Luke, if you want to go first, and then Chris. Hi, um, mine is a bit of a tricky question because I'm basically going to ask you to give away some some of the spoilers for the book itself. Um, I don't, I don't, unlike probably many in the audience, I don't actually know much about the war in question, and the, the siege and the murder. Um, could you just give us a little bit of an overview of that, in particular of the murder and why it happened and how it happened? Um, just so, that, so we can put this into context. Thanks.
Oh, of the murder. Okay. Um, well, what actually happened was towards the very end of the of 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 the period of conflict, um, the freebooters launched what I think was a kind of last desperate attack on Mafeking to try and I think kind of increase their bargaining power in a situation which they clearly saw that you know they were now on the losing end. Um, and Bethel rode out. He needn't have actually done it, but he rode out with a body of men, Baralong men, in the company of Israel Malema, uh, who um, was, you know, one of the leading figures in in, in Mafeking town. Um, and he was accosted there by an Englishman by the name of Harrington. These freebooters, one must understand, were not just Afrikaners, they were not Boers, although they were, in a sense, quite strongly supported by the Transvaal Republic. But they were basically a motley bunch uh, of, of free of freeloaders. I mean, one of whom was, you know, Scotty Smith, who was regarded as, as kind of one of South Africa's leading outlaws. Um, and Harrington said, oh, are you Bethel? And Bethel said, yes. And he shot him in the jaw um, and killed him and left him there. Malema at the time then feigned death. He, he, was, he fell off his horse. Uh, he lay there, I think he feigned death. But so he overheard the conversation which took place. Um, he then went back. Um, the the, the uh, freebooters then took Bethel's body back to Roychrant. Um, there were stories about how his body was uh, badly abused and one thing and another, but none of that was all confirmed completely. Um, and then it, the story is recounted in the book. Uh, he was, when Warren came here, of course, he found Bethel's grave and they, they gave him a proper burial. Uh, SM, uh, perhaps, perhaps one of the most expensive um, burials in British military history um, because it had taken so much time to locate his body and to disinter it, etc. So he was given a very uh, special burial and a particularly fond farewell, uh, uh, poignant farewell by the Baralong themselves um, because at the time, you know, they recognized exactly what he had done, that he had given his life in their service and for their protection. And um, the way that Malema writes about it is, is, is particularly touching, particularly moving, um, at the, 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 the funeral scenes. And, and Bethel's grave is here. It is quite well protected. Um, and at one stage, I had the idea that we could all go down and have a look at it after this address. But I didn't follow up on that. But if you were to go to the stut, it's not far from the, the main stut administrative office, perhaps about 200 meters away. It is protected. It has got a fence around it. And the last time I saw it, um, I can't remember if James went with me, but we took photographs. Um, it was in quite good shape. I'm pleased to say that it was. Unlike quite a number of other sites, uh, particularly burial sites around here, which haven't been that well preserved, um, yeah, so that that's a story about his death, you know, in particular. Thanks, Chris. Hi. Um. Thanks so much. I'm I'm sad I can't be in in uh, Mafeking. I'm I'm joining from from Potchefstroom. Uh, with this question. Um. My questions around uh how much less certain. Uh, the 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 borders and boundaries can look compared to a lot of the the maps we can see even from the period in terms of being painted red and obviously this is a period of flux and um, contestation violence even on the ground um, and so my question is is around if you could elaborate a bit more on Christopher Bethel's role uh, in terms of the establishment of the protectorate uh, in a period of even um, Boer republicanism, short-lived Republic of Stellaland, for example. Um, and so that's on the one hand. And the second might be, uh, uh, 
it, whether you see a role in biography or something like Christopher, uh, looking at a uh, figure of Christopher Bethel and other figures on the ground in ways in that which that could respond to the often, I think, uh, sometimes too simple story of sovereignty, which arises um, in response to looking at histories of colonialism. Um, Christopher Bethel's came, Cambridge, obviously disgraced, but a lot of the histories of sovereignty and even sort of borders and that are focused on jurists. Um, like John Westlake, who's also at Cambridge and, and, and sort of established a lot of the imperial sort of grounds and what's established in international law, looking okay, at Indian princely states, but even place like Bechuana land as different types of sovereignty. So um, what was Christopher Bethel's role in terms of establishing um, some sense of, of borders and boundaries and his own sort of views of sovereignty there? And what role could that play? in terms of maybe challenging some of the existing narr um, narratives around around that. Um, I think really the, the, the Bethel's role in that is that he acted as a, a, a mouthpiece for Monsiwa. Um, and he consistently um, harassed almost would be the right word colonial officials in various capacities um to try and see um the issue of kind of controls and borders from the barrelong perspective um and it was a perhaps a perspective which um wouldn't have ever reached you know the the, the ears or the, the the desks of those people um, had not Bethel been, you know, been been so kind of determined to to bring to their attention um, the transgressions which were taking place uh, in a territory uh, which was meant to be, you know, new, first of all against neutral um, and an area which the Barolong had for very long um, exercised control over the land. Um, so I think from that point of view, you know, he has a, and of course, his death in a sense, as I said earlier on, um, triggered the kind of colonial intervention. Um, the republics of Stellaland and Goshen were very much uh, there at the time. Um, they were fragile states. Um, I'm not really sure where the Goshen um, existed at all. Uh, you know, it, people would simply wander across the Transvaal border every now and then and occupy it and then go back again. So it wasn't much of a state. Um, and Stellaland similarly uh, was in a sense holding apart. But I mean, they did represent territorial uh, enclaves um, in an area which was meant to be um, free, you know, independent free for, for from from kind of white occupation um and uh, those are the kind of issues i think which uh which, which bethel quite consistently argued that this is policy this is our policy and if you're not following policy um you know then you 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 need to kind of do something about it so he was in a sense the conscience uh, a voice of conscience um in a, in a very in an area where these issues were simply being disregarded. Uh, and, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll leave it at that. I think James may want to say something. Thanks very much, Chris. You've just given me an idea for a paper on uh, Bethel's role in advocating the Baralong's position on defining the border and uh, African agency in that process. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Yeah, and we must also remember, of course, there were the Baralong farms, uh, which were Baralong territories in the in the protectorate, um, which of course were divided, uh, which they were cut off from when the, when the border was created. Um, so, so those kinds of issues, I think, you know, they all they're all contained. They all form part of this of the story, uh, either as as a in some senses as a sequel, what happened afterwards. But, you know, 
Bethel seems to play, you know, though he's a hardly known or understood figure, he seems to have created a, a much larger kind of, much bigger waves than would appear uh, to have been the case at the time, perhaps. Thank you. Um, I think we have uh, an, oh, Neil Parsons. There's one last question. Shall we take a very quick question from Neil Parsons? And that would be uh, the final question. Thank you. Neil? Mute. I was just wondering from what you were previously saying about the relationship with John McKenzie. The point about John McKenzie was he was a missionary, then he was blackmailed into becoming a colonial official uh, on the question of uh, Stellarland and Goshen. And he resigned in disgust because he couldn't stand up for African people, basically, because he was opposed by a certain person rising in power called Cecil Rhodes. Now, I'm just wondering, is there any um, evidence at all of any relationship between Rhodes and uh, Bethel, that one making remarks about the other? Um, yes, yes. Um, when Cecil Rhodes came up, uh, he he was sent up. If you remember, Neil to uh, to do a preliminary investigation. I think this was before the Warren expedition was was uh, um, was constituted, um, and he, in fact, uh, if I remember rightly, he did uh, visit the freebooters in in Goshen. Um, um, but they 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 largely kind of laughed him out of court, um, which was uh, which was uh, you know which was kind of ironic, um, you know, given that he at that time or shortly afterwards was 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 pursuing a policy which would have uh, in fact allowed those freebooters some kind of hold in the area. But he he if um, he mistook Bethel uh, or he. He got his name wrong. So how much he really was aware of Bethel um, at the time, I don't, I don't, I can't really say. But uh, you know, you you've you've been through the book a lot. Perhaps you've got something to add on the relations between Rose and and Christopher Bethel. So um, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Um, Where's Neil? <laughs> uh, I've got nothing to add. Sorry, I've got nothing to add. Can you just respond, Neil? I'm just saying I have nothing to add. I haven't done yeah. the research which he's yeah. done. And you haven't come across any closer kind of uh, relationship between them? I would hope to, but I haven't revisited that period for some time. But I hope to do so within a year or two. Okay. I'd like to, just before Neil disappears, again, as I said it right at the beginning, the, the, thank him so much for his support he gave me in writing this book, uh, for his very useful comments and for his ge very generous, um, you know, list, sources which he made available to me, which improved this book very much. So I could just take this opportunity formally, Neil, of thanking you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you, Andy. And we, we really appreciate your time. And uh, I also look forward to reading the book. Um, yes, everyone, uh, if you want to uh, get any further information about this uh, seminar series, uh, please look out for uh, emails from Magdalene um, and from Laura Phillips. And uh, we'll be in contact regarding the, the next session. Uh, anything else from you, Laura? Nothing else from me except to say a big thank you both to um, Andy and James for, uh, for doing the seminar for us. Um, and you'll be in touch, as Robert says, about the next seminar in a few okay. weeks' time. Yeah. Can I just conclude also, as I said at the beginning, I do have three copies of the book here. If anyone would like to purchase it, it's um, going at the very cheapest rate you'll find it. Um, and you don't have to pay for, you know, having it sent to you by post or courier to you or anything. Um, and I'm also happy to sign it for you. So um, Unisa Press, incidentally, uh, 
is not very good, I will put it that way, um, or proactive in promoting its publications. It's been a big, big disappointment for me. Um, so I've had to, to some extent, rely on my own, fall back on my own, you know, recognizances and efforts to try and get the book out there. Um, and it's been a bit disappointing. But like all things, maybe slowly it will seep into people's consciousnesses and be read by a greater number of people and then taken up by some famous movie director, by which time I probably won't be in a position to benefit in any way from whatever material gains might have come out of it. Um, but it is, it's a nice story. It's got all the ingredients. It's got love, it's got war, it's got political repercussions. Um, and I wrote it in such a way, although it's quite a complex period, but I wrote it in such a way as to try and get people interested in this part of the world. Um, the history of Bechuanaland and the Botswana uh, has often been overtaken and by histories of, of other regions in South Africa, particularly in the Zulu, the Pedi, the Poza, etc. Um, and part of this was, was an effort, in a sense, to expose this kind of history, Botswana history, which is just as exciting um, as, as you would find in any other part of the country. Thank you, Andy. That's much appreciated. I'm sure we're going to see a full more series soon. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye.